Okay, um, thanks Simone for the kind introduction and thanks to all organizers for, for inviting me to, to give a presentation. As, as we've seen in, in the previous talk, uh, quantum, quantum meta or um, quantum many body systems can exhibit really very rich and exciting physics. And the aspect that I want to focus on are topological phases that can, can arise. And topological phases in these interacting systems are generically quite hard to, to study on, on classical computers when we want to simulate these systems. And thus, I want to explore some ideas how to use modern well, current kind of um, quantum processors or quantum devices to, to study such systems. And the work that I'm um, presenting has been done in collaboration with uh, several students in, uh, at TAM, including uh, Leo Liu, uh, Bernard Jobs, Julian Bibo, and uh, one of my former postdocs, Adam Smith, who just moved to Nottingham, my colleague, Michael Knapp, and uh, a number of external collaborators that I mentioning later. So the meta kind of surrounding us can, can occur in, in various different phases of meta. And most prominently, we can distinguish phases in terms of spontaneous symmetry breaking. So for example, water can appear in its liquid or in solid phase. And here we have no problem distinguishing these two phases. And, and also we, we know exactly how to characterize phase transitions between those phases. And over the last couple of decades, um, several phases were discovered that lie outside of this simple scheme to classify phases of matter. In particular, these um, topological phases were, were discovered. Topological phases, however, are um, appear in, in very different facets, I would say. So, and, and here in, in this view graph, I'm just dis distinguishing different types of topological phases. On the one hand, we have so-called symmetry protected topological phases. And these are phases of matter that are only well-defined. They can only be, be distinguished from a trivially disordered phase as long as certain symmetries are present. Right? These are phases that do not break symmetries. However, symmetries are essential to define these phases of matter. Then we have kind of genuine topologically ordered phases. These are phases of matter that do not require any symmetry. So they, they are in a way more robust. And in these cases, we have topological invariants that do not require any symmetry in, in the system. And then even more recently, so-called fracton topological phases have been uh, have got a lot of um, attention, which, which are defined in, in terms of rather exotic and um, particles with particle excitation, quasi-particle excitation with reduced uh, mobility. In this talk, however, I want to discuss the former two, namely symmetry protected topological phases and genuinely topologically ordered phases and show how we can use quantum computers to study um, these kind of phases. So and the reason why we are excited about having quantum computers in this context is that simulating the model systems that exhibit or potentially exhibit these exotic types of orders is extremely difficult. Right? So just for concreteness, we might just take a spin one half system on some specific lattice structure motivated by certain materials. And we might wonder what is actually the ground state of this system. If we want to solve this problem in its most general nature, this the complexity of this kind of problem grows exponentially with system size. And because of this, many relevant model systems are still not, not really understood. And there's still a debates going on about what the ground state is of, of certain models. And just to put this into, into numbers, even with the largest computers that we, that we can use, the largest classical computers that we can use, we are limited to the order of 40 um, spin one halves in, when studying spin one half system, or that translates into to 40 or so qubits. However, and this is exciting that even current working com, um, quantum computers have the order of 50 qubits and promise to have a, um, have a fast or quickly increasing number of qubits um, accessible. Right? So, so, so even the computers that we have now 
at least in the sheer number of qubits, are beyond what we can achieve using classic computers when we would like to simulate such systems. However, there are important open questions such as the scalability, the gate fidelity, and the, the noise. So, 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 so that puts strong limitations on actually using these 50 qubits. So and what I want to discuss in the following is I want to use kind of noisy intermediate scale quantum devices, in particular those quantum computers that are available us today, um, and also quantum simulators to investigate the different aspects of topological matter. And I want to talk about two different aspects. In the first part, I want to discuss how we can use quantum computers to study a phase transition um, from a symmetry protected topological phase into a trivial phase and also measure the characterizing invariants, which are in this case so-called string order parameters. In the second part, I want to discuss the second type of topological phase that I, I mentioned, namely these genuinely topologically ordered states. Um, and here I want to show how we can directly measure entanglement entropies and also properties of their quasi-particle excitations. Good. So let me start with the, with the first part uh, of this talk. And to, so as a warm up, let me first look at a model which actually is uh, uh, where, we, where we have a phase transition, in particular quantum phase transition, between two phases of matter that we can distinguish in terms of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Right? So then we have something that we can relate to and something that we understood extend extremely well. And this is a simple uh, transverse field Ising model. So we have a nearest neighbor Ising interaction, uh, ferromagnetic um, Ising action, interaction, and we have a transverse field. In this model, as we tune this parameter G, the system undergoes a quantum phase transition from a ferromagnetic phase where the Z2 symmetry of flipping all spins up and down is spontaneously broken into a symmetric phase where the ground state has the Z2 symmetry of a system. And we can distinguish those two phases um, with the local order parameter simply by measuring the magnetization. Right? So we just have to measure this um, two-point correlator, and that tells us whether we are in the symmetry broken phase or in the symmetric phase. Right? So this is, this is a well-known physics. Now we just take a slightly different model as an example, a model which has a larger symmetry. It's like a Z2 cross Z2 symmetry here. So the Ising symmetry is not restricted to a global spin flip, but we have two sub lattices on which we can flip the Ising spins. And this is a so-called cluster term. Again, if we just tune this parameter G, the system undergoes a, phase a quantum phase transition from one phase to another phase. In this case, however, if we just study the ground state on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this phase transition, it's symmetric on both sides. So clearly we cannot distinguish those two phases in terms of spontaneous symmetry breaking. However, these phases we can classify in terms of symmetry fractionalization. So what it basically means in words is that if we just take a segment with open boundary conditions and we just look how the symmetry acts on a boundary, like say at the left boundary, it acts in a different way on the left-hand side as compared to the right-hand side. And it, from this, we can derive um, string order parameters, like non-local order parameter that distinguishes phases. So in this simple example, we can just take a string where we just multiply poly operators on consecutive sites and we take this expectation value and this expectation value has to be zero on one side and it can be non-zero on the other side. And this is something that we can now use to distinguish those two phases. Good, so now we know that we have a, an example where we have two phases separated by a quantum phase transition and we can distinguish them by measuring non-local order parameters. So and now we gotta look into a model that exhibits all these kind of different phases. And we want to use quantum computers to simulate this, this model. And the model Hamiltonian that we are going to look at is, is shown here. It has this um, kind of triangular phase diagram. So we have this left corner where we have just this cluster Hamiltonian, the right corner, it's just a simple trivial 
paramagnet at the top corner, it's a ferromagnetic Ising model. Now, as we uh, um, tune through these kind of phase transitions, we just kind of go from one phase into, into another. And there's one very nice property of this, this model Hamiltonian. In particular, if we tune and we stick on this black parabola shown here, the ground state is extremely simple. In particular, along this black line, the ground state is simply a two-dimensional matrix product state form. So we have a line at which the ground state is, is, is very easy. And now what we can do is we can now transform the matrix product state into a simple quantum circuit. In particular, this two-dimensional MPS can be simply rewritten in terms of a quantum circuit where we just sequentially apply these two side operators. So this is the first trick. So we have basically now a phase diagram with different phases. And along this one fine tuned line, we actually know how to express the circuit using, uh, we know how to express the ground state in terms of a simple circuit as shown here. But then we use another trick. In particular, if we have now this um, special form um, where, we, where we have this sequential circuit and we want to measure some observables. For example, we want to measure an observable here on this red qubit, like the red blob here. In principle, to calculate this, we have to, if we want to do this in a thermodynamic limit, we have to multiply many, many, many circuits up here. However, instead of multiplying many circuits uh, or contracting all these circuits together, what we can do is we can just replace the last circuit that we, that we put by the fixed point of this. So, so this is the same trick that we are using when solving the 1D um, Ising model with a transfer matrix approach. So we can now just choose a circuit where the last circuit is just chosen to express the largest eigenvector of the transfer matrix. And by this, we can now directly measure in the uh, thermodynamic limit. This is a trick that we also use when using, for example, uh, density matrix normalization group methods directly in the thermodynamic limit. Good. So what we have achieved now is that we have a simple circuit expressing the ground state, and we can directly measure in with respect to a state in the thermodynamic limit. So now we can just take these kind of circuits that we that we can just write down exactly and apply them to uh, basically run this code on, on, on the IBM quantum computer, for example, that gives us the ground state. And then in this ground, so with respect to this ground state, we can now measure the string order parameter, the one that I advertised before. And indeed, we see as we cross through the phase transition here, we see that the string order distinguishes the um, SBT phase from the trivial phase. And where the string order is zero and where it can be non-zero, we can just decide by just choosing a suit suitable operator to terminate this, this string order. So and here I've shown this specifically for one example where we have uh, this kind of cluster phase and the trivial phase. But in a more recent work, we actually showed that this, these ideas can be generalized to, to the entire sort of BD1 class of topological phases. Right? So we can just basically have a, we have a huge space with many, many different topological phases. And if we stay on site a skeleton, <laughs> then we can uh, construct, we can ex uh, write down exact matrix product states and consequently um, exact circuits to explore these, these phase diagrams. Let me now briefly comment on something completely different, at least in terms of the technology used. So, so now we can study topological phases um, also on quantum simulators. And this is done in a collaboration with a group by Emmanuel Bloch, of, of Emmanuel Bloch, where they use optical lattices to uh, trap fermions and can realize Fermi Hubbard letters. Um, as shown here. So, so here is some um, microscopic image of the atoms um, sitting in the, in the trap. And in the limit of strong interactions, this is described by an effective spin model. And this effective spin model, in turn, can realize different SBT phases, the same type of the ones that we, that we saw before. And now, as 
the hopping, uh, the, the horizontal topping and the leg coupling um, is tuned, we can tune the system from a gap phase into a um, quantum critical point. And again, in this case, the string order can, can be measured and the string order then distinguishes the two phases. Right? So, so this is now a very different approach, but the physics is the same. Right? In both cases, we have SBT phases that cannot be distinguished from a trivial phase in terms of the spontaneous symmetry breaking, but instead we need to calculate or to measure non-local string order parameters, which then can be used to distinguish the trivial and the topological phases of matter. Good. So this, this concludes uh, the first part of, of my talk, where I've shown ideas how to use quantum computers and also quantum simulators to study symmetry protected topological phases and also their transitions. On. And now in, in the second part of my talk, I want to discuss uh, how we can realize and characterize topologically ordered states on quantum processes. And I'm following a very similar strategy to, to what I did um, before. Let me first say a few words about these topologically ordered phases of matter. Right? As I pointed out, these phases of matter do not require any symmetry to, to characterize them, but instead um, we have now some sort of uh, anionic excitations that characterize these phases. Right? So basically the way to characterize these phases is that we just look at the quasi-particle excitations on top of the ground states and they have very unusual properties. In particular, they have a statistics that's different from the commonly known bosons or fermions. And as a result of having these unusual um, excitations, we can derive certain quantities that we can look at. And the first kind of topological invariant is the um, topological entanglement entropy. So the bare existence of these anionic excitations um, implies that the ground state wave function has a very non-local entanglement, which means that degrees of freedom that can be extremely far away uh, have to be entangled with each other. Right? And this is different from the ground state of a simple kind of symmetry broken state or even like of the ground state of an SPT phase where we only have short range entanglement. And well, that's a very abstract way of saying it, but there's a very concrete thing to measure. In particular, if we just measure the entanglement entropy, so if we just measure the entanglement entropy uh, that we get for a region that we can cut out of our ground state um, with the rest, we find to leading order an area law, this alpha times L, and on top of it, some subleading corrections to the area law. And this number gamma here is now characterizing the topological order. In particular, for a simple type of topological order, this gamma will just be the logarithm of the number of different types of anions that we, that we have. This number, however, does not uniquely characterize the type of topological order. In particular, we can have different topological orders that share the same value of, of gamma. So in order to have a more concrete characterization of topological order, what we actually want to do is we would like to measure the exchange and the mutual statistics of the emergent excitations. So, so now we have like a few things that we want to look for when we characterize these kind of topological phases. Similar to what I did before, I want to discuss a simple model that realizes this kind of topological order. And one of the most prominent models in this context is the Tory code model, a model that is defined on a square lattice where the degrees of freedom live on the bonds as shown here. So we have now Ising spins or qubits sitting on the bonds of the lattice. And the Hamiltonian consists of two terms. So we have one term that lives on the vertices as shown here in blue. And the term consists of a product of four of those, um, um, like four of um, sigma z's that live on the 
uh, on these um, these stars. And the second term is a product of sigma axis around these plaquettes shown in red. And this model has now the very friendly property that all terms in the Hamiltonian mutually commute. And thus, it's very easy to solve. In particular, we can solve for all of those terms um, independently, and then we can write down the ground state wave function. And the ground state wave function has a very nice form. In particular, the ground state, and if you just write it down on the infinite plane, there's an exact ground state, an exact unique ground state that consists out of the equal weighted superposition of all those states that have an even number of spin ups and down along each vertex. If we just use a nice representation that we say that if a spin is pointing up, we just don't do anything to that bond. If there's a spin down, we just draw a red line. Then this corresponds to an equal weighted superposition of all loop coverings that we can draw onto a square lattice, like one of which I've, I've shown here. And this state exhibits the so-called Z2 topological order. And as we can show with not too much effort, there are like four different types of anions, one being a, a boson, one being a magnetic excitation. This is an excitation on the plaquettes, an electric particle, which is an excitation that lives on, on these stars, and a fermion, which is a bound state of a plaquette excitation and the star excitation. Good. So, so now we have a simple, exactly solvable model that exhibits topological order. Now, the strategy is like similar to what we did before. Let us now come up with a program basically that we can run on, on a quantum computer to, to build this the ground state, right? So the ground state is now this equal weighted superposition of all of those loop coverings. And now we want to produce this on a, on a quantum computer. And we want to do it using very shallow circuits because we know if the circuits get too deep, then the wave function would be kind of messed up. So, so let us now initiate the quantum computer in a state where all qubits are in the, uh, in the zero state. In this zero state, um, and this is now the representation that we kind of looked before, so all the vertex excitations are happy because the product of all sigma z's is, is plus one, and thus those are locally in a in the ground state. However, this is not true for the plaquettes because for the plaquettes, this state where all states are in the SC equals to zero state is, is not a ground state of the plaquette. So we have to do some extra work. And there's now a very simple sequence that, that we um, came up with that we just apply the sequence and the sequence consists now of applying Hadamard gates to a subset of the qubits. And then we can now sequentially apply C0 gates as, as shown here, like just starting from the inside and moving them outside and performing those operations. Once we are done, once we move all the way to the outside, we actually have now a state where all vertices are in the ground state and all plaquettes in the ground state. So this is now exactly the ground state of the toric code. So what we have now achieved is that without actually variationally minimizing the energy of the Hamiltonian, we just directly can construct, we have a prescription that we just apply to on our quantum computer, and then we just produce the ground state of the toric code model. And once you have done this, we can now play games with this state or just basically uh, characterize the, if it just got the right ground state. And the first thing that we do is we just measure all these stabilizers and find that the average st stabilizer fidelity is of the order of 90%. And if you just look at the, uh, at the um, overall fidelity of the state, it's the order of 50%. So it's an, it, it, because the circuits are so shallow, we actually get a very good approximation of the exact ground state. So now we can analyze this, this ground state because now we have basically a computer, like a quantum computer program that produces the ground state of the toric code. Now we can analyze it. And as I pointed out, one of the characteristic features is topological order. And there's a convenient way to measure or to calculate the topological order by using the, the trick put forward by Kitaev and Priskel and also by Levin and, 
And when, and the idea is that we just measure different entanglements, entropies, that we just add and subtract in, in such a way that all the local parts cancel and the only part that's left over is the topological part. And, and this is what we then did actually on, on the quantum processor of, of, of Google. And we did this for various different partitions. And here we see a histogram of the different values that we measure for the um, for S topor for the topological part of the topological contribution to the entanglement entropy. And we see that all of them are centered around the expected value of log two. So what we have shown is that this value actually, like the, the ground state that we produced actually contains uh, this kind of topological long range or uh, non-local entanglement entropy. Let me now briefly comment on the, on the second characteristic property that we look at, namely that we can now, or in order to you know, give a you know, final characterization of topological order, what we want to do is we want actually to measure the exchange and the mutual statistics of the excitations. Right? And commonly the exchange statistics is summarized in the so-called U matrix, where the diagonal matrix, the diagonal matrix which contains the exchange, the phase that we get on exchanging two identical particles. Right? So for bosons, this would be a plus one, for fermions, it would be a minus one. And we have the mutual statistics where we would, uh, it's like a, it's like a, um, not, not a, like this is a, a, a dense matrix where the elements contain now the phases that we get when moving one particle of type of A around some particle of type B. Question like how to measure it. And for the Tori code model, we are again very fortunate that we can do this using quite shallow circuits. In particular, we just know exactly the sequence that we need to apply for moving these quasar particles. If we were to have a more general model where we just wouldn't know this so well, we actually would have to come up with a protocol to move them adiabatically, right? So for example, we would have to take a Hamiltonian and then slowly change some potential to move these particles. But here we can just get away in a cheaper way. And the way that we can then measure the exchange statistics is by introducing some extra qubit, like some an ancilla qubit, the one shown here. And then we just prepare a new state. So we, stay, we prepare a state which is one times our Tori code ground state with some excitations placed somewhere, plus zero times the Tori code ground state with some excitation placed somewhere, as, as shown here. And then we just apply a control U operation. And this operation does nothing in this copy. And in the other copy, it, for example, exchanges or just moves the electric particle around the magnetic particle. And then we can calculate the overlap and, and read off the, the resulting phase. And this is so-called kind of Ramsey interferometry. And now we can collect the, the phases or the information that we, that we get from, from, from this measurement. And we see that it nicely corresponds or like the nicely kind of uh, reproduces the expected values. So just it's a bit of a busy graph, but let me just look at some examples. So here, the, the yellow lines here, this, this corresponds to the exchange of two M excitations. So that we just take two M excitations, exchange their position. These are sort of self bosons. Um, so are the electric particles, and we just indeed get a phase of, of zero. If, however, we are taking a bound state of an electric particle and a magnetic particle, and we exchange them, we pick up a phase of, of pi. And then, so, so this is now a self fermion, or this is like actually a fermion. And same for now the mutual statistics, where we, for example, move an E particle around an M particle, then we pick up a phase of pi, as, as we also would expect from the theory. Good, so we can now extract the exchange statistic or measure the exchange statistics on, on the actual um, quantum device. And let me just only briefly mention that as originally it was proposed, the Tori code model is now a way to, to store logical qubits. And if we change the 
boundary conditions um, to correct boundary conditions and we just get a degenerate manifold. Indeed, we, we showed that we can store logical qubits. And as some outlook and also some advertisement for a paper by um, Leo, I want to say that these ideas that are just discussed here specifically for the for the Tori code extend to generic string net models, right? So we have basically circuits that allow to generate the ground state and also excitation ratings thereof um, for a general abelian and non-abelian um, string nets. So here I really advertise the, um, the poster by Leo in the upcoming poster session. Good, this brings me to the end and let me conclude by thanking all my collaborators. So there were Leo, Adam, Michael, and Christina, who worked with us on the theory for the topological order project on, on the Google computer. Kevin and Pedram, who performed the experiments on the, on the Google site. Then I so think um, Andrew, Bernard, and also Adam for the work on realizing SBT phases on the IBM quantum computer. And I want to thank uh, Ruben, Julian, and Emmanuel Bloch and his group for the nice work on simulating SPT phases on the optical lattice um, um, quantum simulator. So thank you for your attention. And I stop with, the, con con with my conclusions here. Thank you very much, Frank, for this very clear talk. Um, I see one question from Jan von, von Delft, um, who asks in both first and second part of your talk, what did use of quantum computers teach us about the model to be simulated that we didn't already know before? Okay, in, in this case, not much because or nothing to be precise. I mean, in, in this case, we are now using the quantum computer to reproduce results that we certainly knew before. The strengths of what I what I'm I got, the reason why I think that this is useful, what I what I was talking about is, is, is manifold. So for example, in in the first case, we have now like the, ex the example that I demonstrated was for a simple SPT phase where we have a Z2 cross Z2 SPT phase into a trivial phase that we can study using this generated wave function. But this kind of the same idea generalizes to very complicated models, like if I just take, for example, these more complex phases that we can write down exactly, some of them cannot be represented in terms of simple MPS on classical computers because the bond dimension would be too big. And I think it has been shown previously that, for example, as, as with the AKT wave function, that these exact states that we can calculate or that model states in general have been extremely useful to, to, to show things, to, to, to show new things. I mean, the strengths I just see in the fact that this, these are the first baby steps, but we can now just go down this road and then do things that are not possible on, on classical computers. So thank you very much. Um, in fact, I don't see any further questions from the audience currently. So let me propose to thank all the sessions of this quantum matter session and uh, that we all now move to the um, round table where both speakers will be available in two or three minutes. <laughs>